Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats. Good morning. <laughs> Happy Friday. The devotional today will be led by Representative Dan Noyes of Wolcott. Thank you. In preparation for t today's devotional, I reached out to the director of the Lamoille Meals on Wheels for some inspiration. She replied with the following quote from a constituent of mine from Hyde Park. The delivery of a well-balanced meal is essential to my life. It made me think about life here in this building with its never ending stream of meetings, committee work, caucuses, and floor debate from January to May. Today I ask you to join me in thinking about the contrast between our seemingly non-stop world and the lives of many older Vermonters who receive Meals on Wheels. Today, March 22nd, March marks the 51st anniversary of the Older Americans Nutrition Act program, creating the first federal program to support the health and well-being of older Americans through nutrition services. In Vermont, 45 Meals on Wheels programs deliver 1 million meals to 16,000 16, older Vermonters and individuals with disabilities. But there's more to Meals on Wheels than a meal. It's about companionship, relationships. It's a check-in that reminds people they are not forgotten. Perhaps you have volunteered to deliver Meals on Wheels in your community. I know that our work here would prevent us from taking on a regular route, but there's always the need for substitutes. Give it a try. Find out the volunteer needs in your community and help spread the word. Right now, back at home, volunteers are heading out on their routes, braving muddy back roads, potholes, snow squalls. Their pay, hundreds of smiles. A Couple of miles, hundreds of smiles. That's what fuels the volunteers who make sure older Vermonters have a well-balanced meal. Thank you. Members, it is our custom on Fridays to honor former members of the House who have passed away since our last memoriam. Please rise as we remember a former member of the House who we lost earlier this week. Representative Timothy Hayward of Middlesex was born in 1941, served in the House from 1977 through 1978 and passed away on March 17th, 2024. Please join me in a moment of silence in memory of Representative Hayward. Members, we have four Senate bills for referral today. The first is Senate Bill 55, which is an act relating to authorizing public bodies to meet electronically under Vermont's open meeting law introduced by Senator Clarkson and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-55, an act relating to authorizing public bodies to meet electronically under Vermont's open meeting law. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Senate Bill 186 is an act relating to the systemic evaluation of recovery residences and recovery communities introduced by Senator Lyons. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-186, an act relating to the systemic evaluation of recovery residences and recovery communities. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Human Services. Next is Senate Bill 284, which is an act relating to student use of cell phones and other personal electronic devices in schools introduced by Senator Williams and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-284 an act relating to student use of cell phones and other personal electronic devices in schools. Now the bill's been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Education. 
And finally, Senate Bill 289, an act relating to age-appropriate design code introduced by Representative Rom Hinsdale and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-289, an act relating to age-appropriate design code. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Members, we have received a request to read a House concurrent resolution that the House and Senate adopted pursuant to the consent calendar. HCR 169 is a House concurrent resolution honoring Norwich University Athletic Hall of Fame member Harold Martin in celebration of Black History Month. Please listen to the reading of the resolution. Whereas Norwich University's first black cadet, Harold Doc Martin, pioneering, Doc Martin's pioneering academic, athletic, and leadership achievements foreshadowed his distinguished academic, coaching, and military career. And whereas as a varsity athlete on the ice hockey surface, probably the first black collegiate ice hockey player in the nation, on the black baseball diamond, on the track, and on the gridiron where he proudly served as captain, Doc Martin was a valued team member. And whereas Doc Martin rose to the rank of first sergeant in the Corps of Cadets, served on the Norwich University Student Council, and was the athletic, direct, athletic editor of the student publication War Whoop. And whereas he earned a master's degree from New York University and held faculty posts at Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia, and Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. And whereas starting in 1927, Doc Martin served as director of, of athletics at Virginia State University. And beginning in 1932, he became director of health and physical education at Minor College in Washington, DC. And whereas Doc Martin played for a season with the Pittsburgh Keystones of the former Negro Leagues baseball. And he coached nine of his college teams in various sports to college to Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association Championships. And whereas in 1942, Doc Martin joined the Army Air Force, and in 1943 was appointed director of the ground school at Tuskegee Airfield in Alabama, earned the rank of major and was tragically killed on March 23, 1945 in a plane crash near Reedsville, North Carolina. And he was buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery. And whereas in 1984, Doc Martin, class of 1920, was inducted into the Norwich University Athletic Hall of Fame. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly honors Norwich University Athletic Hall of Fame member Harold Martin in celebration of Black History Month. And be it therefore resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to the Director of Campus and Athletic Communications at Norwich University. Are there any announcements? Member from Milton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Harold Doc Martin was a true Renaissance man throughout his entire life, but especially while at Norwich University. A groundbreaking cadet that shined in almost every endeavor he undertook, his many accomplishments almost seem impossible for one man to have single-handedly done. The Norwich University Athletic Hall of Fame member was a star football player, captain of the hockey team, played baseball, ran track, was a member of the student council, sang in the glee club, played in the mandolin club, was the athletic editor for the war whoop, and all the while studying electrical engineering. No slacker. Uh, his entire life was a list of pioneering endeavors. It almost seemed as he was predestined to routinely break down barriers. After graduating from Boston Latin School, he became the first black cadet in Norwich history, but it'd only be the beginning of a long line of firsts for Doc. He's also the first black athlete to play for the cadets, and by all accounts, is the first black athlete to ever play college hockey in the United States. After a distinguished career as a college coach, instructor, and administrator, Doc Martin's lifetime of exceptionalism continued during World War II. While being an instructor at Minor Teachers College, he, like so many other Americans, willingly answered the call to defend the country. Much like the rest of his life, he was again associated with groundbreaking greatness, and this time it would take him to the Tuskegee Army Airfield. Few military units have garnered as much notoriety for their successful heroic actions as the Tuskegee Airmen. The Tuskegee Experiment, that was known in its early years, built one of the most successful air units in military history. Doc first arrived at Tuskegee Army Airfield in May of 1942. He would be promoted to director of ground school in March of 1943. 
Noteworthy is the fact that he was instrumental in the training of these Tuskegee Airmen, affectionately known as the Red Tails, for their painted red tails on their Mustangs. The Tuskegee Airmen, renowned fierce fighters and combatant commanders, were quick to request them for fighter escorts for bombers on their runs into enemy territory. We have had the honor of having some of the Tuskegee Airmen here in our body. They certainly lived up to the George Orwell quote of, people sleep peacefully in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Norwich can proudly lay claim to the heritage of Doc Martin that worked with and trained these men to go into the dark of night and defend America. Doc continued his role as director of the ground school until March of 1945 when he met an untimely death in a military um, accident. He was subsequently buried at Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors. In a tribute piece in Varsity, a nationally recognized publication focused on historically black colleges and universities after his passing, it stated, the college community, athletics, public school physical education, camp life, church work, the war program, it is incredible the man could have made an honest contribution in so many fields of work. Tomorrow would have been the 70, will have been the 79th anniversary of his death. We are fortunate to have with us today representatives of the Norwich community, uh, Norwich University community to help commemorate this recognition of Doc Martin. They are William Kolb, a student at Univers Norwich University, Reed Curry, Associate Vice President of Development and Alumni Engagement, and Mark Kolb, Director of Campus and Athletic Communications. They're seated in the balcony and I would request we recognize them. Thank you. Will the guest of the member from Milton please rise and be recognized. member from Barry City. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Uh, coincident with uh, Civics uh, Learning Week, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Barry delegation to uh, welcome to the House a Spalding classes in history, social studies, and the like. And uh, I wish you to give them a warm welcome to the People's House. Thank you. Will the guest from the member from Barry City please rise and be recognized? <laughs> member from Wolcott. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Chitton, Chittenden eagerly awaits March for some kind of a game or something. But our guests today also have something to celebrate, March for Meals. From all corners of our state, older Vermonters rely on our guests to develop menus, secure funding, recruit volunteers, order, cook, and package meals, and make sure older Vermonters do not go hungry. We also have guests from our senior centers who anchor our communities with wellness classes, help people with taxes, find services, and to make sure older Vermonters are welcomed. They represent our area agencies on aging and the Vermont Association of Senior Centers and Meal Providers who collectively work to implement our Age Strong Vermont plan, making sure Vermont is the best place to grow old. Please take a moment to visit them in the card room and join me in welcoming them to the People's House. Will Thank the guest of the member from Wolcott please rise and be recognized. Member from Brandon. Madam Speaker, I am very pleased to uh, welcome three very special people um, who are visiting the State House today. Uh, Nick Parnell and Heidi Cohen uh, traveled from Needham, Massachusetts to visit us and to get a glimpse um, into the state political system and see our beautiful State House. Needham, um, uh, I've known Heidi since our early days at UVM and has been a lifelong friend. Um, I'd also like to welcome my husband, Brian, who's here today with us. And without his support, this job would be nearly impossible. So I'd like to welcome him to the State House as well. Please join me in welcoming these three very, very special people to, uh, to uh, Montpelier and to our State House today. Thank you. Will the family of the member from Brandon please rise and be recognized?
Member from Brownington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This morning, I would like to introduce to this body my wife, Liz, who I couldn't be here without, and my two stepsons, Joey and Kevin. Will the family of the member from Brownington please rise and be recognized? <laughs> member from Pulteney. Madam Speaker, it's not often we uh, get to appreciate the work that our doorkeepers do each and every day. Uh, not only doorkeeping, but a myriad of other jobs that they do on our behalf. So um, I would like you to please join me through you in wishing uh, Brett Murphy, one of our doorkeepers, a very happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Are there any further announcements, member from Waterbury? Uh, Madam Speaker, I move that uh, your House Human Services Committee be relieved of S-189, an act relating to mental health response service guidelines and social service provider safety, and that the same be committed to the House Health Care Committee. The member from Waterbury moves that the Committee on Human Services be relieved of Senate Bill 189 and the same be referred to the Committee on Health Care. Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have relieved the Committee on Human Services of S-189 and committed the same to the Committee on Health Care. Are there any further announcements? Member from Thetford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, rumor has it there's a little snowstorm coming. Um, some of you may remember the winter of 7980, which was, at least in the Upper Valley, essentially an open winter. We had a little snow in October, and the, 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 the fields and everything were pretty much barren until spring. Terrible. Um, but at our town meeting that year, a fellow stood up and noticed that we hadn't spent much of anything in the highway budget and suggested that we just delete that and give it back to the taxpayers. And the town moderator, who is a pretty savvy guy, said, may I remind the gentleman that the blizzard of 38 was in March. So here we are. Um, but to continue on the snowstorm theme, Madam Speaker, if any of us are out on the road this weekend, I'd urge everybody to watch for oncoming, oncoming traffic if you have to get out to clear your windshield, remembering our good friend Greg Clark, who lost his life because Someone didn't see him cleaning his windshield off over on Route 7, I believe. So please be careful, Madam Speaker. Everyone here, thank you. Are there any further announcements? Seeing none, orders of the day. Members, a quick update. There is a new amendment to House Bill 639 that has been sent out. So we are gonna start with House Bill 121 and then we'll come back to 639 just so everyone has a moment to read that amendment. So with that, House Bill 121 is an act relating to enhancing consumer privacy. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H121, an act relating to enhancing consumer privacy. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from Coventry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we heard a, a very riveting uh, re a floor report uh, yesterday um, and a, a very thorough report on uh, H-121. As the member from Bradford uh, said yesterday that um, this is a, a bill that actually started or being con started to be contemplated in 2019 um, when we um, started having discussions with the Attorney General's office on what we need to do to um, protect Vermonters' data and protect their privacy. 
In 2020, we continued those discussions. Um, in March of that year, pandemic hit. Um, that kind of ended the discussions up to that point. But we did ask the Attorney General to continue to engage um, people and come back to us with uh, some thoughts. Um, Attorney General did that, but of course in 2022, 23, and 21, 22, and 23, um, we were extremely busy and trying to appropriate dollars to help our business community. Um, and so um, through those years, we still were not able to um, really do anything with H121. Um, last year, in April, we um, took a look at 121. Um, I think we, um, and the Attorney General's office, um, we had worked with to put together a bill. But it was used, uh, the bill was, was put together using, um, I think, old information um, because of the time spread between the time we asked the Attorney General. And so um, I think we had a discussion. We decided that it made a lot of sense to us that we tried to do our best to um, follow along Connecticut's lead. Um, in our work that we do insure, with insurance, um, that is uh, not regulated by the federal government either. So um, the states have adopted model laws um, to make sure that the insurance industry can operate throughout the 50 states. And we adopted that same, uh, same philosophy on this data privacy bill. But the bill actually started in Washington, as the, the member from Bradford stated yesterday. And although Washington hasn't passed it, it was a good piece of legislation that started the ball rolling in other states. And so as we adopted Connecticut and has all, all these other states, these other 14 states have adopted some version of uh, privacy, data privacy laws, um, they, they're, all the states are learning as we go forward and understanding what works and what doesn't work what more we need to do to continue to protect um, our consumers' privacy and their data and give them the ability to um, have some say over what is done with their identity. And so you, you'll see that this bill isn't exactly Connecticut, that we've taken pieces from other states, but we've added like other states will do after us in creating a strong law throughout the country, hopefully, that is more um, is modeled after specific language that the businesses can follow through all the states. So that's what we have done. And we have, uh, I think, done pretty well. Um, but also through this journey, um, you know, it was our plan last summer to actually have a few committee meetings and start working on this bill. Then the flood hit in July. We were already scheduled to hold our hearing to start working on that, and we shifted. And we held a hearing to better understand what our business community was going through two weeks after the flood. Then we lost our legislative council who left, um, who, who left service um, and went to now the Secretary of State's office. That dealt us another blow. I asked uh, uh, your vice chair, Madam Speaker, the member from Brandon, and the member from Bradford to take on the task of putting this bill together. And they agreed, and it's a good thing. I'm glad they did. Um, 
because I wasn't feeling very strong, I wasn't feeling very good that we were going to be able to actually put this huge, comprehensive, complicated bill together. But with a lot of um, discussions with people from around the country, other legislators, other organizations, um, the member from Bradford, I think has become uh, one of the experts around the country. And then we, were, we received uh, two new legislative council members, thank God, who are doing yeoman's work. And the legislative council member who was appointed to take this task on um, had to immerse himself into how all of this works. And he was able to do it. A great job. Thank him very much for working with us and working with others. And what you have before you is a bill that will help Vermont consumers protect their identity, to have control over their identity, to be able to say what they want done with their identity and what they want done with their data, to make sure it's accurate. And if they don't like what a business is doing with their data, they can opt out and tell the company, get rid of my data, take, take it away. This is extremely important to our Vermont community, all Vermonters. And because of that, Madam Speaker, I would ask that the vote is taken to be taken by roll. The member from Coventry requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll as the member sustained. The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from Williston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am so grateful for the long overdue protections that H-121 will provide to all Vermonters. And I rise today to speak in particular support of the section of this bill that protects Vermont's kids. The immense harm being done to kids throughout this state, country, and indeed the world by the deliberate profit-driven actions of controllers, as they're called in this bill, such as social media companies, can no longer be tolerated. These platforms are knowingly addicting our children to their products and services, an act that's made possible in part through the mining, sale, and misuse of children's personal data. Some time ago, I heard a former Silicon Valley entrepreneur explain that if you're using a service that you think is free, then you are the product being bought and sold. I thank the committee for their diligent work on this bill, and I look forward to this body's continued efforts to regulate and hold accountable an industry that shamelessly causes and then profits from the tragic and sometimes deadly decline in youth mental health. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrews of Westford. Yes. Two minutes.
Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats? Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of an electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during a roll call. And when the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so the clerk can accurately record your vote. The question is, shall the bill pass? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Andriana of Orwell. Anthony of Berry City. Yeah. Arison of Wethersfield. Arsenault of Williston. Yeah. Austin of Colchester. Yeah. Bartholomew of Heartland. Yeah. Bartley of Fairfax. Yeah. Beck of St. Johnsbury. Rebecca of Winooski. Byron of Virgins. Yes. Black of Essex. Yes. Bloomley of Burlington. Yes. Bongards of Manchester. Yes. Boslin of Westminster. Boyden of Cambridge. Yes. Brady of Williston. Yes. Brannigan of Georgia. Yes. Brennan of Colchester. Yes. Brown of Richmond. Yes. Brownell of Pownell. Yes. Brumstead of Shelburne. Yes. Burdett of West Rutland. Yes. Burke of Brattleboro. Yes. Burroughs of West Windsor. Yes. Bus of Woodstock. Yes. Campbell of St. Johnsbury. Yes. Canfield of Fair Fairhaven. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Carpenter of Hyde Park. Yes. Carol Bennington. Yes. Casey of Montpelier. Chapin of East Montpelier. Yes. Chase of Chester. Yes. Chase of Colchester. Yes. Chestnut Tangerman of Middletown Springs. Yes. Christy of Hartford. Yes. Gina of Burlington. Clifford of Rutland City. Yes. Coffee of Guilford. Yes. Cole of Hartford. Conlon of Cornwall. Yes. Corkin of Bennington. Yes. Cordes of Lincoln. Yes. Damar of Venusburg. Demereau of Corinth. Yes. Dickinson of St. Albans Town. Yes. Dodge of Essex. Yes. Dolan of Essex Junction. Yes. Dolan of Waitsfield. Yes. Do Donahue of Northfield. Yes. Durfee of Shaftesbury. Elder of Starksboro. Emmons of Springfield. Yes. Farley's Rubio of Barnett. Yes. Galfetti of Berrytown. Yes. Garifano of Essex. Yes. Goldman of Rockingham. Yes. Ghostland of Northfield. Yes. Graham of Williamstown. Yes. Granning of Jericho. Yes. Gregoire of Fairfield. Yes. Hengo of Berkshire. Harrison of Chittenden. Hedrick of Burlington. Yes. Higley of Lowell. Yes. Holcomb of Norwich. Yes. Hooper of Randolph. Yes. Hooper of Burlington. Yes. Houghton of Essex Junction. Yes. Howard of Rutland City. Yes. Hyman of South Burlington. James of Manchester. Yes. Jerome of Brandon. Yes. Kornheiser of Brattleboro. Yes. Krasnell of South Burlington. Labor of Morgan. Yes. La Bounty of Linden. Yes. Lally of Shelburne. Lalone of South Burlington. Yes. Lamont of Morristown. Yes. Lanford of Virgins. Yes. La Russia Franklin. Yes. Levitt of Grand Isle. Lipsky of Stowe. Yes. Logan of Burlington. Yes. Long of Newfane. Yes. McGuire of Rutland City. Marcotte of Coventry. Yes. Mazin of Thetford. Yes. Matthews of Milton. Yes. McCann of Montpelier. Yes. McCarthy of St. Albans City. Yes. McCoy of Poultney. Yes. McFawn of Berrytown. Yes. McGill of Birdport. Yes. Mahali of Callis. Yes. Minier of South Burlington. Yes. Morgan of Milton. Yes. Morse of Springfield. Yes. Morse of Bennington. Yes. Rowicki of Putney. Mulvaney Stanek of Burlington. Nicole of Ludlow. Yes. Not of Rutland City. Yes. Noise of Wilkett. Yes. Nugent of South Burlington. Yes. O'Brien of Tunbridge. Yes. Odie of Burlington. Oliver of Sheldon. Yes. Page of Newport City. Yes. Paella of Lennonderry. Yes. Parsons of Newberry. Pat of Worcester. Pearl of Danville, P. 
Peterson of Clarendon. Yes. Pouch of Heinsberg. Yes. Priestley of Radford. Yes. Quimby of Linden. Yes. Rachel Center Burlington. Yes. Rice of Dorset. Yes. Roberts of Halifax. Yes. Sam is a Castleton. Yes. Sackowitz of Randolph. Yes. Shia Middlebury. Yes. Shaw Pittsburgh. Yes. Sheldon of Middlebury. Yes. Sibelia Dover. Yes. Sims of Craftsbury. Yes. Small of Anuski. Yes. Smith of Derby. Yes. Squirrel of Underhill. Yes. Stephens of Burlington. Yes. Stevens of Waterbury. Yes. Stone of Burlington. Yes. Supernon of Arnard. Taylor of Milton, yes. Taylor of Colchester, yes. Templeman of Brownington, yes. Salino of Brattleboro, yes. Tooth of St. Albans Town, yes. Torrey of Moortown, yes. Troyano of Stannard, yes. Walker of Swanton, yes. Waters Evans of Charlotte, yes. White of Bethel, yes. Women of Bennington, yes. Williams of Berry City, yes. Williams of Granby, yes. Wood of Waterbury, Andriano of Orwell, Arison of Wethersfield, yes. Beck of St. Johnsbury, yes. Burbeko of Winooski, Boslin of Westminster, yes. Casey of Montpelier, yes. Cole of Hartford, yes. Elder of Starksboro, Ems of Springfield. Yes. Hango Berkshire. Hyman of South Burlington. Levin of Grand Isle. Mulvaney Stanek of Burlington. Odie of Burlington. Parsons of Newberry. Pearl of Danville. For purpose of explanation, member from Westford. Madam Speaker, as a parent and as a legislator, I stand in unwavering support of this comprehensive privacy bill, especially in the critical, the critical provisions aimed at safeguarding our children's future in the age of big data. Member from Jericho. I vote yes to make Vermont the 15th state to protect the data of its citizens. This is a thoughtful bill that delivers a delicate balance, providing consumer protections while still allowing a business to thrive in the 21st century. Member from Essex Junction. Madam Speaker, I vote yes for Vermonters and appreciate that this bill works with HIPAA, preserves the provision of care and holds entities handling sensitive information to the same HIPAA-level duty of care they are well-versed in. And member from Ludlow. Madam Speaker, I vote yes. This bill is a significant step forward in protecting Vermonters and their data from predatory companies. I am particularly supportive of this bill because of the geolocation data provisions in Section 2428, which will enhance protections for people exercising their reproductive rights in Vermont. Member from Dover. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Three transformative forces are pressing on Vermonters. Demographic shifts and the aging of the workforce, climate change, and the digitization of our economy and everyday life. I worry we aren't responding with the speed and accuracy needed to help Vermonters manage these transformative forces. Today, thanks to the leadership of the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee, and in particular, the work of the member from Bradford, I'm relieved that we will take this important step forward to help protect Vermonters in the digital age, and we'll vote yes. Member from Franklin. Nope, yes, Franklin. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I'm very, very pleased that we can... Uh, Ms. Ne uh, member, would you like to explain your vote? Yes, I'd like to explain my vote, and I'd like also mm -hmm. like to change my vote if I may. Oh, yes. So I, I would like to change my La vote to a yes. LaRussia Franklin. And I'd like to explain my vote. Member, you need to, you need to respond to the question. LaRussia Franklin. Yes. Thank you. And I applaud the, uni uni the unity that we're showing here today. And so uh, in respect for that, I want to vote yes. And I, I do agree with this bill. Thanks. 
Member from Brandon. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. H-121 is a strong consumer protection bill. Protecting our personal information, our face, our fingerprints, our gate, address, shopping habits, running routes, travel, our biometric and our personally identifying data is more important now than ever, and it belongs to us. 14 states have passed data privacy legislation to protect consumer privacy, and Vermont is poised to be the 15th and a national model. Data privacy is a vitally important topic and rightfully should be a federal law, but this is not happening. and has become each state's responsibility. The Commerce and Economic Development Committee has built on the work done across states in this country and by national experts to create a data privacy, work, data privacy bill that works for all Vermonters and all Vermonter businesses. And I'm very, very proud of the work that we've done on this bill. Member from Williston. May I please explain my vote? You may. I voted yes because all Vermonters deserve the protection provided in H21, but especially for our kids. Predatory data usage causes real harm. This bill is one step to work to mitigate that harm. Members, please. Oh, member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Uh, Madam Speaker, I vote yes, but we cannot stop here. We must go further and protect neural data as we stand on the brink of the merging of humanity and our machines. Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 139. Those voting no, zero. The ayes have it, and you have passed the bill. Next is House Bill 639, which is an act relating to disclosure of flood history of real property subject to sale. Will the House please come to order? Prior to third reading, the member from, Ro from Lowell, Representative Higley, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Lowell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, members can find the amendment on page 1979 of today's calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. I spoke to this on the floor the other day when the uh, bill was originally presented um, talking about the number of things that we do here that uh, increase the cost of housing. Uh, I believe that this was one of them as well. Um, and looking at the bill, there's even the provision that talks about uh, a little section on 2911 talking about the access board shall adopt rules as necessary to implement the provisions of this section. Again, I had a good conversation with uh, uh, the committee yesterday um, saying how uh, this this is really a, a practice that is uh, uh, followed already today uh, in regards to any state money that uh, goes into uh, uh, residential housing. Um, with that uh, section that I just uh, referred to, I'm a little bit concerned about, uh, again, the Access Board uh, adopting rules, not really knowing uh, what those additional rules could be. Um, I'm concerned that um, through the VHFA, there's all kinds of programs, um, and, and some of them are, are very small amounts of money that you may qualify for, for closing costs and, and things like that. So I, I wish, in a sense, that uh, there may be a, a provision eventually that would um, uh, not allow this provision to go into place because... And it was not, not really determined how much this adaptability cost might be for a residential home. Um, but so maybe there should be some provisions around um, finding that out for sure and having uh, some money that you may apply for for VHFA uh, have these homes not necessarily qualify. Because if you're only qualifying for a $5,000 um, uh, piece to help you out, uh, and, and the cost of that adaptability is over $5,000. Uh, again, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I also am concerned about the creep uh, as far as uh, uh, not an actual creep in the room, but again, uh, creep by uh, what we do down here as far as uh, um, possibly putting it into uh, uh, general law in the sense of uh, uh, there was a, a report due on S100 last year in regards to uh, statewide um, uh, in, inspections of homes and, and building codes uh, following the residential building energy, energy standards and so on, and, and I worry about uh, that going further. 
But Madam Speaker, again, in, in talking with the committee and, and finding out that it's, it's currently a practice, I would ask uh, leave of the House to, to remove my amendment. Thank you. Absent objection, leave is granted. Members, there is an amendment printed in the calendar from the member from Newberry, Representative Parsons. It is my understanding that the member from Newberry will not be offering that amendment. So with that, prior to third reading, the member from Waterbury, Representative Stevens, offers an amendment to the bill that the first assistant clerk emailed to members at 9.43 this morning. This amendment also appears on the House Overview webpage and paper copies are available at the main table. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, a quick history on Recovery residences, this amendment has to do with trying to figure out or provide a potential solution for the tenancy issues that are complicated when it comes to recovery residences. Um, first and foremost, what is a recovery residence? For those of us, we, we it, they've been around now for several years um, and this problem has not yet been solved. So this again, this, this amendment is to present a solution uh, to a really key issue here. Res recovery residences are not state agencies. They are not um, part of the state of Vermont government. And that has created um, a small problem, which is when someone chooses to apply and gets into a recovery residence, uh, those residencies are usually longer than 28 days. They could be as long as a year or 18 months and someone who is in a recovery residence is trying to maintain their recovery and their sobriety. Our state law, within landlord-tenant law, limits the ability to evict someone or to have them removed or discharged to 29 days. Um, after that, an individual becomes a tenant at will. And if someone who is at the recovery residence either has a behavioral problem or has a, a relapse of their, sub, of their own substance use disorder, uh, the, the process of trying to protect everyone who is in that recovery residence has become clouded by this fact that there is our state law that applies to residences such as these. And so for many years, uh, the recovery residents, um, there's, there is a certifying organization for recovery residences, and they've been trying, along with the Department of Health and other advocates, to solve this problem. And last year, Maine passed a law that provided some direction that may work for us, and the stakeholders, um, people who would represent not just um, individuals or organizations that deal with recovery residences, but also for tenants at large, um, worked this past weekend when this, when this language became available and we realized that there was a gap between what was needed by the recovery residences and what was needed for overall landlord tenant law. And this is a gap that's existed since the onset and the um, growth of recovery residences. Recovery residences in the state of Vermont are not very numerous and one of the reasons we have heard through um, on Re recovery day about a month ago was that this particular issue is stopping people from being able to open residences fully understanding what our tenancy laws are while it was successful in maine or new hampshire similar language it's easier because the recovery residence programs are part of state government in those states, and that is not the case here. So it required and has required a long conversation for more than a few years about how to solve this. And H, this amendment to H 639 is, the, is our committee's proposal. The first thing it would do in section 8A is that it would create exclusions. So for the next year, this, this, in, this process will be sunsetted um, in due time. This would allow a recovery residence that's adopted a written exit and transfer policy approved by the Vermont Alliance of, for Recovery Residences uh, may ex immediately exit or transfer a resident in accordance with the policy if the exit or transfer is necessary for the resident's welfare, the resident's needs cannot be met 
at the recovery residence or the health and safety of other residents or recovery resident employees would be at risk if the resident continues to reside at a recovery residence. All of that sounds fine with the exception of the, how do we help the person who had to be exited. And in the case of what has been testified is, the, is for common practice, um, is while not flawless, is that the recovery residences that have been certified by VTAR um, do try to find further locations for those individuals. But again, this is, these are private organizations who are operating off of guidelines which are national best practices. And while the state of Vermont has recognized VTAR as the certifying organization for these residences, they are still, there's still a disconnect between their existence and our state government, which gives us the opportunity to have oversight in a more direct manner. So section 8B is a recommendation that the Department of Health in consultation with state agencies and community partners shall develop and recommend a certification program for recovery residences operating in the state. We need to raise the bar for recovery residences. They are an important, small but important piece of our recovery program. And this is gonna raise the bar on the quality of the programs that will be certified. Um, it, so this, this whole section 8B creates, it's a list of things that this Department of Health study and proposal of legislation shall contain. On or before October 15th of this year, the department shall submit that written report describing its recommended recovery resident certification program and containing corresponding draft legislation to the House Committee on Human Services and to the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare. The point of having that date is that if there is uh, a, a sunsetting to happen on the first process, that we will have time in the State House to um, review the recommended legislation and to uh, do our own work on it. Legislative intent, section 8C. It's the intent of the General Assembly upon passage of legislation codifying the recovery residence certification program recommended by the Department of Health to repeal 9 VSA 4452, which is this exemption uh, stated in section 8A, and then to add an exemption from the application of 9 VSA chapter 137, which is about rent, residential rental agreements for occupancy in a recovery residence that's been certified by the Vermont Alliance for Recovery Residences uh, according to the requirements of the certification process recommended by the Department of Health. Again, the important piece is making sure that there is a connection and a nexus between state government and these programs and the organizations that are doing the certification. Um, section 8D, is um, just a section about reporting that these um, recovery residences will report the number of individuals who have been exited from the programs. And the Department of Health will have reporting programs as well. The last piece of note is that after passage, the title of this bill will be amended to read an act relating to flood risk disclosure, accessibility standards for state funded residential construction, housing accountability and recovery residents evictions. Um, I do want to thank the members of my committee for incredibly passionate and um, deep conversations on what this means, not just for landlord tenant law, but also for the state of recovery in the state of Vermont. We've seen deaths increase at a level we've never seen before over the last several years. And while recovery residences are not the only solution, they, they provide a place for people who choose to live in this circumstance in a group home with others, with other peers in order to support their own sobriety. It is not a panacea, it's not the be all and the end all, but it is an important tool. It's been successful, it's had flaws, and this is a step along the way for us to take responsibility in our, um, in our desire to see people recover in a safe way. Um, 
I appreciate the, the uh, work of Representative Parsons and others in my committee and ask for your support. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Waterbury? Are you ready for the question? Member from Burlington. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, may I interrogate the presenter of the amendment? You may. Member from Waterbury is interrogated. Madam Speaker, when a person is exited from one of these recovery residences, where, do, where can they go? I, where I don't do have, they go? I don't, um, Madam Speaker, I don't have a direct question for that. That's, that's, a, that's a piece of process that is within the recovery residence itself. Um, we didn't take testimony on exactly where people may be um, taken. Madam Speaker, when a person is struggling with maintaining recovery and has a relapse, what are some of the supportive or transitional housing options that they can access once exited from a recovery residence? Um, Madam Speaker, once again, we didn't take testimony specifically on where folks would go. We were focused solely on this particular process. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I support Th this amendment, but I'm, I am concerned about us creating a policy that's going to th um, th throw people out of their housing when they relapse without the proper safety net in place. So I'm hoping this body can continue to do the work to building a comprehensive continuum of housing from the most secure to the least secure that provides people's with, people with the, um, the services they need to meet their needs so that they can recover and thrive in the community. Thank you. Member from Middletown Springs, I neglected to ask for a struple. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the member from Waterbury for, uh, for this amendment. I would also like to thank the member from Newbury, um, as well as the representatives from VTAR and Le Vermont Legal Aid, who have worked uh, very hard on this in, in recent days. Um, this amendment is a perfect example of how a simple little fix has very far-reaching tendrils and can uh, tie into long-standing problems and, uh, and, and as well as providing the areas, uh, pointing out the areas where we need to progress in the future. Uh, the committee found this bill favorable by, uh, this amendment favorable by a vote of 831, and we ask for your support. Member from Barry City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I interrogate the presenter of the bill for the amendment? The member from Waterbury is interrogated. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I may be axiomatic, but let me ask an obvious question. Is it not true that substance abuse and the uh, hopeful uh, recovery thereto are questions of public health and safety? I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, can you rephrase that question? Yes, is it not true that substance abuse and the hope for recovery of an individual subject to that malady, is that not a matter of health? Um, Madam Speaker, that is a matter, um, it's a matter of um, in certainly individual's health and certainly the public has, the public as we would define it, has an interest in making sure that uh, individuals who have a substance use disorder are um, given the opportunity to come back to health. Thank you. And Madam Speaker, do we also agree that if as a matter of health for a citizen of Vermont, if that care, recovery, were undertaken as a matter of state responsibility by a state agency such as the Department of Health, we would not be having to weave our way through a labyrinthian exception to general law involving tenancy. Ma Madam Speaker, it's a fact 
that the state of Vermont does not have an organized or sanctioned program um, for recovery residences and that we have heard conversations for years that the recovery programs and rehab that may be available to individuals who would like to, you know, who either choose to, to undergo um, rehabilitation or are ordered to, uh, we, the state of Vermont does not support um, or pay for the, the amount of services that perhaps have been shown to be best practices. Recovery residences are, as I mentioned earlier, they're a smaller um, support system for recovery. Uh, an individual has to be in recovery and has to be sober before they are allowed to live in these, uh, these, these residences. They have to uh, submit to signing a contract and saying that they'll have a job and they'll stay in recovery. And, and, and yet we do have this piece about tenancy in our landlord tenant laws. So whether or not one would disappear if the state's response was more robust is I think an argument that can be made. Um, but until we decide to fund at levels that are necessary and that have been shown to be of best practices, we are found, we find ourselves with individuals and organizations who are really passionate about allowing and trying to create places where people feel safe in order to support their sobriety. Thank you, member. Madam Speaker, I cannot uh, restrain myself from pointing out that this, among several branches of potential application of state responsibility, continues to go begging. And it creates, as I think this amendment demonstrates, a myriad complication for both administration and undertaking one of the fundamental responsibilities of the state of Vermont or the Republic of Vermont for that matter, which is the health and safety of its citizens. As the member from Waterbury has pointed out, this is not a recent development. Successive executive and legislative branch continue to contract out core responsibilities of a state. And it's simply creating a complication that then people complain about or a failure in the standards of delivery of service, which then people complain about. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Burlington. Uh, Winooski, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I too have some questions about the amendment. So may I interrogate the presenter of the amendment? The member from Waterbury is interrogated. Uh, Madam Speaker, earlier there was mention of uh, testimony that was taken. Can, can, the, can you tell me more about what testimony was taken on this amendment in particular? Uh, Madam Speaker, we were made aware of the language that of, of, the, uh, of a similar bill that passed in Maine last year um, back on Recovery Day, which was, I believe, in February. And some weeks later, we've, we reviewed that language in, up and through last week and this week. Um, we took testimony primarily from uh, Vermont Legal Aid, representative from Vermont Legal Aid, and representative, an advocate for um, the Vermont Association of Recovery Residences, uh, as well you. as legislative counsel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so you did not take any testimony from people with lived experience? Uh, no. Okay, I, uh, I thank the member. Uh, Madam Speaker, while I, I understand the concerns that are addressed in this amendment, I, I fear that we are, are rushing to uh, exempt protections for tenants in this state without doing due process and hearing from all of the stakeholders. Um, I don't understand why we are putting this amendment on a flood bill when this should really be a bill that stands on its own so that we have the due process and are able to hear from all the folks in the in the. Uh, recovery sphere. I, I fear that in a year where we're talking about a housing crisis, when we're talking about people who are being evicted by no cause evictions, um, I, 
I wish we would have gone in the direction of protecting tenants' rights rather than removing tenants' rights for people in recovery. Uh, I think there is some great processes in here in working collaboratively with the Department of Health and creating those guidelines. But I fear that putting the exemption before we put these guidelines and process in place is actually to a, a detriment for people in recovery. Uh, to that effect, Madam Speaker, can I uh, read a quote from the Special Assistant to End Homelessness in Burlington? You may. Uh, the Special Assistant to End Homelessness, when uh, she was made aware of this amendment, said, I met someone last night who relapsed and was exited from sober housing but now has a period of ineligibility with the Economic Services Division for a motel stay because he, quote, caused his own homelessness. So we are literally kicking people when they are down um, simply because we recognize that relapse is a part of the recovery process. Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish that we had due process on this amendment, and since that has not been done, I will not be supporting it. Member from Waterbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I want to address the issue um, that the member from Burlington uh, questioned about uh, a few moments ago in terms of uh, what supports and services would be offered for individuals who may relapse and may be exited from a recovery residence. And um, I do want to point out that the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee uh, which this body established has prioritized a million dollars um, in uh, which hopefully will be voted out of our appropriations committee this after this later this afternoon um, for exactly that to establish community based stabilization beds uh, for individuals transitioning between phases of substance use disorder treatment and the recovery system. Um, the beds will provide short-term stays while providing mental health, substance use treatment, or recovery support, or any combination thereof. And they shall serve in the following individuals. Uh, and um, among those are people awaiting intake at residential uh, for residential treatment, and uh, specifically those individuals who have experienced relapse while in residential treatment or a recovery residence and are coordinating the next steps in their treatment or recovery. So um, this this issue that the member raised is definitely an issue that uh, we have been uh, discussing and debating in the House Human Services Committee, and we were uh, very happy to see that being recommended by the Opioid Settlement Committee for use of opioid settlement funds in FY25, and that is what we recommended to the House Appropriations Committee. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Waterbury? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H 639, an act relating to disclosure of flood history of real property subject to sale. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, the ayes do have it, and you have Excuse me, you have uh, passed the bill. Up next is, we're going back in order here. Up next is House Bill 706, which is an act relating to banning the use of neonicotinoids pesticides. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H706, an act relating to banning the use of neonicotinoid pesticides. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Now we'll take up bill, House Bill 845, which is an act relating to designating November as Veterans Month. 
Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H 845, an act relating to designating November as Veterans Month. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Next is House Bill 878, which is an act relating to miscellaneous judiciary procedures. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H-878, an act relating to miscellaneous judiciary procedures. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Now we'll turn to House Bill 546, which is an act relating to administrative and policy changes to tax laws. The bill was referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which recommends that the bill be amended as printed in today's calendar. The member from Brattleboro, Representative Kornheiser, will report for the committee. Carrying an, appropriate, an appropriation, the bill was referred to the Committee on Appropriations, which recommends that the report of the Committee on Ways and Means be amended as printed in today's calendar. The member from Middlebury, Representative Shy, will recommend for that committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. H546, an act relating to administrative and policy changes to tax laws. Reporting for the Committee on Ways and Means, a member from Brattleboro. Madam Speaker, H546 is our annual housekeeping bill. We call it miscellaneous tax in the Ways and Means Committee. You can find it on page 1981 of your calendar, but I recommend joining me and following along on the fiscal note, which can be found on the fiscal information tab on the bill's site. By tradition, this bill is revenue neutral, and much of it um, is proposals, proposals of technical changes um, from work that we did last year that needed a little tweak and work we're looking to do in the future. Section one is a technical, technical correction to clarify statute to align with existing practices of appropriating funding for municipal grand list reappraisals and maintenance costs from the general fund. That has no fiscal impact because it is how we already do our work. Section two grants the discretion to the Division of Property Valuation and Review, which we call PVR, to allow towns to have education grand list values recalculated in response to judicial decisions without waiting for the town to fully exhaust its judicial appeals. Last year, as a body, we spent quite a bit of time talking about reappraisals and the value that the um, Division of Property Valuation and Review um, has in supporting municipalities in defending their property appraisals in the face of appeals and how that both impacts the municipal grand list but also our statewide education grand list. And we want to make sure that municipalities are using their resources towards this in the most efficient and effective way possible. This piece came to us from the tax department on request of the Division of Property Valuation and Review. Sections three and four is our annual link up to federal income tax laws. We do this every year, um, and they are essentially in effect backdating to December 1st, 2023. This might get more exciting next biennium as um, we are expecting significant changes in federal tax law, but this year it is an uneventful link up. Section five is an expansion of the renter credit. It would expand the eligibility for the renter credit by increasing the income limit from 50% of the area median income to 65% of the area median income. 
doing this would enhance the value of the renter credit for 4,000 recipients and make the credit accessible up to 3,000 more applicants. The Department of Taxes brought this request to us after realizing that the full general fund appropriation of $9.5 million to this has been underutilized for the last few years by almost um, between two and $3 million. And um, part of that is even with controlling for the impact of the pandemic era housing subsidies, when they look at the rise in incomes and um, really realign their projections with the changes that we made in the renter credit a few years ago, they suggested that this would be the most effective way of designing that program. And your Ways and Means Committee agreed with the suggestion. Sections six and seven eliminates the $15 late penalty fee for late property tax credit applications. We did some work last session to move out some of those dates and essentially enable folks um, who might not have heard about property tax credits and the need to apply for property tax credits in time um, to be able to catch up in advance of their um, tax payments. It will have no state level fiscal impact and is not likely to modify behavior significantly. Sections 10, 11, and 12 are extensions of sunsets on existing taxes. The section 10 is an extension in the fuel tax, um, extends the sunset by five years. The fuel tax funds our home weatherization assistance program and is not the kind of fuel that we use for our cars. It is the retail sale of heating oil, propane, kerosene, and dyed fuel, as well as natural gas and coal and electricity. We propose no changes to these rates and are essentially just continuing to extend the sunset as we do. Sections 11 and 12 is a sunset on the health IT fund and health care claims tax, which is the revenue um, source for the health IT fund. We're just doing that for one year um, to give us a chance to dive into that further. Sections 13 and 14 are the product of your Ways and Means Committee's continued work to modernize our tax code. Section 13 is a local government revenue working group responding to the requests of municipalities, the League of Cities and Towns, and various members of this body asking us to look more deeply at appropriate mechanisms for municipalities to meet their fiscal needs. And that working group has no fiscal impact and we are looking forward to hearing their recommendations next year. And finally, section 14 is a wealth tax commission to study the taxation of wealth and investment gains that currently escape income taxation. Your committee on ways and means had regular conversations about the shift in income and wealth over the last 50 years and the need to better understand the ways that folks are able to legally avoid taxation and how that um, burden sits on our middle and working classes here in Vermont. Um, the mechanism for um, funding that commission is going to be amended by the House Committee on Appropriations, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, very importantly, that commission is actually going to be working very deeply with tax attorneys, um, tax experts, and um, folks in other states to understand what a multi-state work on this might look like, so Vermont doesn't have to be doing this work on their own. Um, our witnesses, which are hard to read because I'm sitting in this lovely pool of sunshine here on the House floor, but it's creating some glare on my computer, were the Director of Policy from the Office of the State Treasurer, Legislative Counsel from the Office of Legislative Counsel, the Associate Fiscal Officer from the Joint Fiscal Office, Deputy Commissioner, and the Executive Policy Advisors from the Department of Taxes, um, a member from the House Committee on Appropriations bringing us their amendment, the Natural, National Research Director from the State Innovation Exchange, Law School Foundation Distinguished Professor of Tax Law and Policy from the University of Missouri School of Law, 
um, Legislative Counsel from the Office of Legislative Counsel, a tax attorney from North Pomfret, and a professor of law at UC Davis School of Law. Our vote out of committee was 11-1-0, and we ask for the body's support. Thank you. Now for the Committee on Appropriations, member from Middlebury. Uh, Madam Speaker, the House Appropriations Committee appreciates the opportunity to weigh in on this bill. We made two changes to H-546, which can be found on page 1990 of today's calendar. First, in section 13, related to the Local Government Revenue Working Group, in subsection C, sub 1D, we took out the phrase sports betting transactions as part of the review process because we learned from the Department of Liquor and Lottery that it potentially violates our contracts with the sports betting platforms. Second, in section 14, as has been uh, referred to already, the Wealth Tax Commission in subsection H, we have added the words to the extent funds are available. So it now reads, to the extent funds are available, the sum of 125,000 is appropriated. At the moment, there are not funds available, so there's no general fund money in this bill at the moment. The committee vote was 9-3-0, and we hope you'll support us by voting yes on this amendment. Thank you. Member from Brattleboro. Madam Speaker, your Committee on Ways and Means appreciated the work of the House Appropriation Committee, both ruling out one option for our working group so that there um, can be more narrowed and focused. And um, we appreciate all of the work that they are doing right now to move to some more contingent appropriations in many bills. And I imagine we were going to hear that phrase again. And our vote on the Appropriations Committee amendment was 10-0-2. The question is, shall the Committee on Ways and Means be amended as recommended by the Committee on Appropriations? Are you ready for the question? M member from Lowell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I inquire of the presenter from the Appropriations Committee, please? The member from Middlebury is interrogated. Madam Speaker, you referred to uh, when the funds are available, and I think we're going to hear that quite a bit. Uh, and a, and a number of bills coming up. And I'm just wondering and asking the question, uh, which bill would take priority? How has how that worked out when you may have a number of bills where you refer to them as when funds are available? I don't know that I have an answer to that question, Madam Speaker. I don't know what the universe is. I uh, am not aware of any particular priority. Um, prioritizing at this point in time, so I don't feel uh, that I'm able to answer that question. Thank you, members. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, a concern for me, I know um, a lot of well-intended bills are out there and, and has are gonna have this wording on it. Um, and to me, um, I just think that, uh, yeah, I, th there maybe ought to be a process and, and I don't know how that, how that would work out, but, uh, to have a number of bills have that wording in it, um, uh, I'm I'm just uh, a, a little bit confused as to what those priorities would be. Thank you. The question is: Shall the report of the committee on ways and means be amended as recommended by the committee on appropriations? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please, please say nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have amended the report of the Committee on Ways and Means. Now the question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means as amended? Are you ready for the question? Member from Clarendon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm voting no to this. Uh, the constant search for taxes to take out of the pockets of the people uh, need to, needs to stop and we need to stop spending as much money, plain and simple. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means as amended? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. nay. 
The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Now the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have, and third reading is ordered. Next up is House Bill 612, which is an act relating to miscellaneous cannabis amendments. Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I move that we postpone action on H1, or excuse me, H612, one legislative day. The member from Virgins move that, moves that we postpone action on House Bill 612 for one legislative day. Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have postponed action on House Bill 612 for one legislative day. Next up is House Bill 6. 2-2, which is an act relating to emergency medical services. The bill was committed to the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs, which recommends that the bill be amended <clears throat> as printed in today's calendar. The member from Cambridge, Representative Boyden, will report for the committee. Affecting the revenue of the state, the bill was referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which recommends the bill ought to pass as when, recommend, when amended as recommended by the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. The member from Craftsbury, Representative Sims, will recommend for the committee. Carrying in appropriations, the bill was then referred to the Committee on Appropriations, which also recommends the bill ought to pass when amended as, as um, recommended by the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. The member from Chittenden, Representative Harrison, will recommend for that committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. H622, an act relating to emergency medical services. Reporting for the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs, the member from Cambridge. Madam Speaker, H622, an act relating to emergency medical services, would equip the EMS Advisory Committee to evaluate the current state of the EMS system, expand training and expand training opportunities. This bill would also update the circumstances under which ambulance service providers are reimbursed for delivering services to Medicaid beneficiaries. EMS includes three main branches of service, a timely robust 911 response, large incident response, and medical transportation to definitive care. As a critical part of healthcare, EMS providers across the state strengthen our communities during times of crisis. Vermont's EMS system is a patchwork. Across the state, EMS crews range from full-time to part-time to volunteer. Some volunteers pay for their own trainings out of pocket. Some are awarded grants. The funding system is inequitable, which causes volunteer retention issues, gaps in service, and overlapping service areas. In 2023, EMS providers responded to 124,740 calls for service, an increase of 22% in the last five years. However, on an annual basis, the overall turnover of EMS providers within the EMS indus industry ranges between 20% and 36%. EMS is a critical part of healthcare and a key service within communities across the state. H622 is one of the many steps forward in investing in our EMS providers, their training, and best practices. I will now walk through the bill, and if you'd like to follow along, H622 can be found on the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee website or on page 2002 of today's House calendar. Section 1 amends 18 VSA 901 to include purpose and findings with Vermont's standard of policy for emergency medical services. Section 2 amends 18 VSA 908, Emergency Medical Services Special Fund. This existing special fund supports online and regional training programs, data collection and analysis, and other activities relating to the training of emer emergency medical personnel and delivery of services. 
In subsection 2A, additional language is added for the Commissioner of Health to prioritize the use of, use of funds to provide grants to programs that offer basic EMS training at low cost or no cost to participants. Subsection 2B will require reasonable efforts to award grants in a manner that supports geographic equity among the EMS districts. This is to ensure that grants are available to support EMS training in districts that have historically experienced challenges in receiving grants from the fund. Section 3 amends 33 VSA 1901M, Reimbursement for Emergency Medical Services. Subsection A directs the Agency of Human Services to reimburse a provider of emergency medical services to a Medicaid beneficiary who is not transported to a different location during the emergency. The reimbursement shall be in an, equal, in an amount equal to the Medicare basic life support rate. Subsection B includes that annually as part of the Agency of Human Services budget presentation, they shall report the amount of additional funds that would be necessary to reimburse EMS providers at a level equal to the Medicare basic life support rate for all emergency medical services delivered to Medicaid beneficiaries. Section 4 amends 24 VSA 2689 reimbursement for ambulance service provided to Medicaid beneficiaries. In accordance to 33 VSA 1901M, which is what I spoke to in section three. Section five amends 18 VSA 909 EMS committee. By providing the existing committee with the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the Agency of Human Services. Subsection E adjusts the committee's standard of annual report on the EMS system. The committee will now be required to develop and maintain a five-year statewide plan for the delivery of emergency medical services in Vermont. The plan shall be updated at least annually and include specific goals for the delivery of emergency medical services, a time frame for achieving stated goals, the cost data and alternative funding sources for achieving stated goals, and performance standards for evaluating stated goals. goals. An annual report reviewing progress made towards achieving the goals in the plan and set by the committee shall be delivered to the Commissioner of Health and the General Assembly. Section six, EMS Advisory Committee, Statewide EMS System Design. This section further directs the EMS Advisory Committee to collect data necessary to conduct a complete inventory and assessment of the EMS services currently available in Vermont. This includes the number of full-time and part-time personnel, the total spending on EMS, projected budgets for EMS providers, and information regarding identified gaps in services. The advisory committee is also directed to provide recommendations relating to EMS district structure and authority, workforce training standards, resource allocate, allocations, an annual review process for EMS providers, budgets, a governance model, cost estimates for implementing the recommended system, facil facilitation and coordination of training, and any other areas the EMS advisory committee deems necessary. The advisory committee may hire a project manager and one or more consultants to assist the committee in its work. Section seven amends 32 VSA 8557, Vermont Fire Service Training Council. By increasing the total sum of the fire safety special fund, as well as increasing the amount within this fund that shall specifically be allocated to the EMS special fund. This increased allocation specifically goes towards EMS training and workforce development. Section eight, Medicaid emergency medical services, treatment without transportation appropriation. Provides funding for Medicaid reimbursement to EMS providers when there is not a billable transport. The global commitment, commitment funds is split between roughly 42% state general funds and 58% federal funds. Section nine, this act shall take effect on passage, except section six F, the EMS advisory committee appropriation and section eight shall take effect on July 1st, 2024. The committee heard testimony from Deputy Commissioner, Department of Public Safety, Director Bennington Rescue, Director and Chief Counsel, Office of Leg Legislative Counsel, um, Director, Department of Emergency Medical Services, Town of Barrie, 
President, Professional Firefighters of Vermont, President, Vermont Ambulance Association, Chair, Vermont EMS Advisory Committee, Chief Glover EMS, Senior Physical Analysis, Joint Physical Office, Director of Emergency Preparedness, Response, and Injury Prevention, Vermont, De De Vermont Department of Health, the bill sponsor, Fire Chief, Springfield Fire Department, AEMT slash Educator, Northern Emergency Medical Services. The bill passed at a committee on a vote of 12-0-0. Your Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs respectfully requests your support. Now for the Committee on Ways and Means, member from Craftsbury. Madam Speaker, as we just learned from the uh, member from the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs, H622 is an act relating to emergency medical services and includes several provisions related to the um, provision of EMS across Vermont. Your Ways and Means Committee focused on Section 7 of the bill, which has a revenue impact. Um, you can find the fiscal note for this bill on the fiscal information tab of the bill's page, and you can find section seven on um, 2008 of today's calendar. So section seven deals with the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund. This was a fund created in uh, 2011 um, to support the training of EMS personnel. The fund is currently supported by a $150,000 allocation from the Vermont Fire Service Training Council. And the Vermont Fire Service Training Council is supported by an annual collection of $1.2 million collected from insurance companies that underwrite certain insurance policies. Of that um, full amount, 100,000 is allocated to um, entry-level firefighter training and 150,000 is allocated to the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund. That 150,000 um, assessment for the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund has not been increased since it was um, originally authorized in 2011. Section seven of this bill um, increases the amount collected for the Vermont Fire Service Training Council from insurance companies by 300,000. So it would go from 1.2 million to 1.5 million. And the increased revenues would be allocated to the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund, increasing the total allotment from 150,000 to 450,000. Your Ways and Means Committee heard testimony on H622 from the Director and Chief Counsel from the Office of Legislative Counsel, Government Relations Director from Premier Piper, Eggleston and Kramer, and the Principal Fiscal Analyst from the Joint Fiscal Office. Your Ways and Means Committee voted uh, this bill out of committee on a vote of 12-0-0 and respectfully requests uh, support for this bill. Thank you. And now speaking for the Committee on Appropriations, member from Chittenden. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Committee on Appropriations, as many of you are aware, are searching wide and far for any available general funds. So we get a little bit apprehensive when requests come in for new general funds, as probably some of you are well aware of at this point. But we appreciated the opportunity to receive H622. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that we all support um, efforts to provide additional training and to try to figure out um, some of the issues with emergency services and how we can enhance it going forward. The committee amendment can be found on page 2010 of today's calendar. And it's pretty simple, but it does some important things. First of all, in section six, it strikes out subsection F in its entirety. Member, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we need to just take a quick brief um, recess on lang language. Um, can I see the member up at the podium, please? The House will stand in recess for approximately two minutes.
Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats. Members, the language of the amendment did not make it into the calendar, so we have our first assistant clerk emailing the language out now. So our plan uh, after conferring with all House leadership is that we'll take um, a 10 minute break so members have a chance to review it and then we will come, I'll gavel back in at 1140 and pick up where we left off. So the House will stand in recess until the fall of the gavel at 1140.